Good morning, everyone. Let's stand as we sing the chorus. There's just something about that name. And on the second verse, the choir is going to sing, or on the second go-around, the choir will sing it through one time. So at the second time around, y'all just take a listen, please. Number 202, Amazing Grace. On the second verse, let's get around and greet.
Good morning. Quite a few things to talk about today. I'll start with our um, prayer letter for Brother Binda. He's our missionary in Liberia. Just a summary, they are in desperate need for financial assistance for um, another school bus to be shipped from the U.S. to Liberia. So please be in prayer for that and for God to God to work there. Um, they do have a praise. They had five of the young people that got saved on Sunday and were baptized. Amen. Amen. There's a whole lot of information in this letter, as there are other letters over there. I encourage you to take a few and, and read them. Um, there will be no choir practice today. We will have Jonathan's class at 5 p.m. today with Brother David Campbell tonight at 6 o'clock following Jonathan. And then after Brother David Campbell, our missionary, comes and speaks to us, we'll be having a fellowship over in the fellowship hall. We will be having sandwiches. Um, please sign up on the sign-up sheet in the back table for the Thanksgiving banquet coming up in November. And we will have fifth Sunday singing next Sunday. So make sure that you sign up to volunteer for that, or you will be volunteered, as usual. Um, we need some other volunteers to help clean the building. So if you can, if you are able, please sign up on the sheet for a weekend that you can come clean the building at the church. Unless there's anything else, I think that's all that we have. Hymn number 553, Sweet by and by. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it Seventeen. I'd rather have Jesus. This will be our offering. Him.
In number 404, The Solid Rock. at the words and Lord this hymn we sang a couple of t- uh, songs ago I'd rather have Jesus than anything Lord that's that's what it's about Lord we know that you are here with us this morning Lord we know that you are here with us each day as we walk through our life if if we let you walk with us Lord it's up to us each day whether to let you walk beside us help us through the days through the nights, and Lord, we just uh, pray for each one here this morning and just ask that uh, you bless each one present in a special way and that they would know that each day that you are present if we but call on you. Lord, we pause now. We just lift up Miss Judy. She comes to, to bring your message and song, Lord. Lord, just, uh, Lord, even now, uh, loosen up her voice, give her peace, give her comfort. Lord, just sing the melodious tune that you want sung this morning. Lord, just uh, be with her. Lord, our pastor, as he comes to open up your holy word, Lord, just even now, as I always pray, Lord, if there's something that needs to be changed, even now, Lord, change it. Just be with him, speak through him. Pray that there's one here lost this morning, that something said or done might draw them closer to you, Lord. Lord, if there's some that are dealing with heartaches, pain, sickness, ailments, whatever it might be, Lord, this world is full of problems and we face them daily, but Lord, we know that you are there to turn all our problems over to you. Lord, we just thank you again. Just bless this rest of our service. In your sweet name I pray. Amen. Try. 
burdens hard to bear. Remember at your lowest, He is always there. When there's no hope, there is grace. When you feel too weak to stand, let the blood This morning, what uh, what started out many months ago as a uh, as a devotion for me, basically, um, we went on a quest to find some information. I, I read something in the scripture, and I thought to myself, I just I just kind of want to do a devotion on this particular subject. But in doing so, I uncovered something that I thought would be very, very interesting. So let me just preface by saying this. This information that you're going to be hearing over the next several weeks started many, many, many months ago. It was not just a, a weekly study. This thing enveloped me for for many, many, many months. And I I did not have liberty to start studying this in full until these last couple of weeks. And in in this, I discovered something that I thought would be helpful for a church and be helpful for us as individuals. Now, remember, this started as just a personal study just for me. I wanted to find out when I read this scripture, I wanted to find out what's the big deal with this? Why does it matter? And how does it apply to me? And in doing so, I unearthed so much information that there was no way that I could cover this in one particular week. So I don't even know if I can get through my first introduction in one week, which for you, you'll say, well, good. Well, maybe it's not so good. I don't know. But we're going to give it a try and get get as far along as this as we can. Now, remember this. we, we, We have to start somewhere. So where we're going to start, remember this, it's not where we're going to end up. Do you got this so far? Where we start is not where we're going to end up. But I will tell you, there is a common chord through this. And that's the reason why we're going to start where we are. But I'm so, I'm so glad to be here this morning. I'm so glad to see you guys. And I trust that you have come this morning to get your spiritual cup full. Amen. The songwriter said, fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up and, you don't know the song, but make me whole. So we understand this. We come here on a Sunday morning to get our cups. You you guys are weak this morning. You come here to get your spiritual cups. All right, all right, stay with me. 
This is not sleep time. This is engaging time. This is get our minds and our spirits off the things of the world and onto the things of the Lord. Would you agree with that? All right. Uh, well, we, we want to show you something that I think that's interesting as we, we get started, but let me give you this. I think that, that the following information will make more sense as we, we, we know this. Now, I've got to start where we always need to start with in a particular message, and it's this. Now, I always take for granted what I'm fixing to tell you, but on this particular subject matter, I don't need to take it for granted. So let me just start out this way. If you do not know Christ as Savior, then the following information probably is going to be little value to you. If you don't understand that Christ ought to be the first and foremost decision that you need to make in your life, then everything else is what we're going to try to build on is that foundation of Christ. Does that make sense to you? Give me a hearty amen. amen. If you don't know Christ Jesus as Savior, then the following information is not going to be applicable to you. So I am urging you, I'm imploring you, whether this is your first time here or if this is your 150th time here, if you do not have an abiding presence of Christ Almighty, if you've never asked Him in your heart, this will be the Sunday to do so. So that everything that we say here for the next couple of weeks will be applicable to you, and not only applicable to you, but also to build upon your foundation of your faith. Now, in order to get where we need to be, I want to start with a New Testament story, and then here in just a moment, we're going to jump to the Old Testament. So, for the sake of reference and for the sake of time, I'll ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. The Gospel of Luke, <clears throat> chapter 2. Now, remember, I told you from the outset, we'll start here, we're just not going to end here. Luke, chapter 2, if you will, and notice verse number 46. Luke, chapter 2, and verse number 46, a very familiar story. We'll jump here, and we'll go somewhere else here in just a moment. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him, speaking of Jesus, in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding. And watch this. Not only were they astonished, look at this, that was hearing him, but they were astonished at his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Question. Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, now notice what's Jesus' response as a, as a young boy. How is it that you sought me? Question. Wist you not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them, talking about his parents, and came to Nazareth, and he was subject unto them. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in stature and favor with God and man. Now, I understand that you Christians in this room already know this story. But there is a concept that's presented here that you may not know. As a matter of fact, let me just tell you something just to be very candid with you. I'm not so sure that I've ever heard a message or a series of messages on what you're going to hear in these next couple of weeks. And the reason why this intrigued me so much is because I started investigating some things on my own account and started thinking, I've never heard this before in this particular fashion. So I thought the information that I was learning was new to me, as new as as far as being in a series or in a, in a coherent, a coherent co comprehensive way. And I thought, maybe there's just something to this that I have missed in my spiritual journey that maybe would make sense and maybe could unlock a spiritual door for you. 
And I thought, if it unlocked a spiritual door for me, guess what? It might just unlock a door for you. So, when I looked at this and I said, now preacher, if you start with this story, everybody in the church is going to go, oh well, so what, we've heard that all of our lives. Okay, but maybe, would you give me just a little bit of attention and maybe just think to yourself, maybe I haven't heard the rest of the story. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time. I pray, Father, that we'll not waste time, we'll not be an entertainer, we'll not be a comedian, but, Father, we will stick to the word of the living God. Father, I trust that everything that's said here this morning will, will just come from heaven. Father, my heart has needed this message and message is as long as I feel like, Lord, this is the direction that you would have me go. Lord, in the process, I have seen some things that I have overlooked in my Christian life. And I feel like, Lord, that I have grown because you have showed me this. And Father, if there's anything that I desire from our church family is spiritual growth. Lord, I pray that you'll unlock the doors that's been locked for many years. And I pray, Father, that we'll have the courage to go through them. God, give me exactly what you would want. And as Brother Randy prayed, strike from me things that just simply don't need to be stated. Father, we need you. I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you Bible students will recognize this story we just read as it presents Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. And he camps out at the temple among the experts at the law. You could say that young Jesus was holding his own among these very educated Bible scholars. I want you to notice verse number 47, if you will, and notice the, the kind of in, in important verse this is in that story. The Bible says this, and all, now that's interesting, it wasn't just some of them, look what it says, and all that heard him were astonished. At his understanding, now watch, stop right here. Let me just give you something. Stop right there. It's one thing to have head knowledge about the word, but it's another thing to have heart knowledge. So here was, here was preteen Jesus. Watch. Is every, is everybody focused this morning? If I look up here, here is preteen Jesus sitting among the experts of the law. Now, we're not talking about people that just had a kind of a cursory information about the Bible. We're talking about people whose whole life depended upon the written word, right? So here is, here is young Jesus. He's sitting among the very educated of the educated. And look what the Bible says. They were all in this group, and Jesus was astonishing them. Now, watch this. Watch. When the Bible says that he was astonishing them, here's what Jesus was doing. Those, watch, those people were doing like this. Those people were in awe of Jesus. Look at that last word. Come on with me. Answers. These were the men that could confound everybody that's ever walked on the face of the earth. These are the men that considered they had the whole Torah memorized. These are the men that everybody looked to for the answers. And now Jesus, as a preteen, walked into their midst. He was, he was asking questions. And then not only was asking questions, but his answers were giving them food for thought. Now, wait a minute. How in the world could a preteen give these guys any information? Well, can, can I tell you? Because he was the son of the living God. That's why. So here was this young boy started out. Now watch this. They heard him were astonished. He just let them, left them spellbound. Now, here's, the, here's my question to you. What kind of questions? Look at verse number 46. What kind of questions do you think Jesus was asking them? Look what it says. They found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors. Don't mean med ed uh, medical doctors, just uh, religious. 
both learn, hearing them and asking them questions. Now, wouldn't you like to heard the questions Jesus was asking these guys? Do you think that maybe he was asking them who did they think that who was God, right? Maybe some of these theological questions. I don't know, but I can tell you, whatever the questions that Jesus was asking them, these guys probably had to think. You know what the Pharisees and the scribes were. Now, with all of the things that we say about them, one thing they had was they were very, 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 very knowledgeable. They knew the written word, and the Bible says that Jesus asked them so many questions that they were astonished. Now, don't you think that in that setting, it would have been good to just to kind of sit there and watch? Here was this young boy, he was astonishing all of these educated men, and they had to think, who in the world is this little guy? Wow! So we hear, we see from the very outset that Jesus was a very, very, very interesting person to be around with. Now that statement will come back here in just a moment. So now he's in this temple, his family started home, Jesus remains at the temple, surrounded by the spiritual elite. Now, it must have been interesting to hear all of this conversation. But in the midst of his parents headed home, look at verse number 48. I know you know this, but it sets up what I'm fixing to tell you. In verse number 48, it says this, And when they saw him, they were amazed, and all of his mother said unto him, Now what? Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father, and I have sought thee. Son, you should have been with us. You don't understand, son. When we started home and this great big company was with, watch this. Moms, you you can sympathize with this. You should have been here. Now, maybe that's a way that we don't see it in the scripture, but maybe mama was kind of scolding Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Good night. I was panicked and I was worried. And where were you? What what do you think he thought? Well, he tells us what he thought. Are are you still with me? Okay. Now, all of this is leading to a a point. I I want you to see. So, we understand the panic and and, and all of this. So, Jesus basically said, I must be about my... Father's business. So that's, that's you know, maybe with this public reprimand that she did to Jesus. And, you know, certainly she didn't understand all of the things that, that was going on there. But I want you to jump down to verse number 52. And this is our jumping off point. Verse number 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Well, thank God. And in favor with God and man. Now, I want you to just. In your subconscious mind, just awake long enough to hear this word. Then you can go back to sleep. But if you don't hear this word, you're going to miss the next couple of weeks. Are you ready? I want you to notice something that has been impressed upon me for literally months on end. Months on end, and I'll show it to you. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Here's the word I want you to see. Favor. Favor. Now for the next weeks as God leads, I want to bring you to a point to where you're going to start adding this Bible word to your spiritual vocabulary. Now there's a lot of things that come out of our mouths that's probably not good. Amen, preacher. Some of you are not going to agree with that. That's okay. Some of the things that come out of our mouths are not good, but this one word is a very good word for us to start thinking about. We'll start in the next several weeks. We're going to start talking about the favor of God. Now, I've, I've, I, I've read this and I thought to myself, let's just make some notes. Let's just grow from this. Let's see how this applies to me. And from all of this, it came to where we're going to be in these next week. Does this make sense to you? Because I want you to see and enjoy some of the things that I've discovered in this journey. Now, 
in this word, the word favor, it literally means, if you want to look this up in the alliteration of this word, literally means acceptable. It means, watch this, it means grace, it means joy, and it means kindness. Now watch this. If you want to have favor with somebody, somebody may ask you, could you do me a... Now this is what, watch, this is what the physical favor means, approval or support. If I ask you to do me a favor, Tammy, will you do me a favor? Here's what I'm asking. Approval, support, or liking for something or something, an act of kindness. So I'm asking you, will you do me a favor? I'm asking you, will you do me a kindness? That's the, that's in a physical, come on, somebody amen. That's in the physical realm. But if you look at the word, uh, if you look at the word favor from a spiritual perspective, it means grace, joy, and kindness. Now, are you still kind of with me? Watch. Grace, joy, and kindness. This means, watch, that Jesus was full of grace, joy, and kindness. When you saw Jesus, he had grace. When you saw Jesus as a 12-year-old, he had kindness. Everywhere Jesus went, he displayed joy, grace, and kindness. That's what he was about. So Jesus was, uh, was now watch this, not only was Jesus full of this, but when you get to Luke chapter 2, he said he had favor with all men. So Jesus displayed joy, grace, and kindness with everybody he came into contact with. Well, preacher, good night. He, I know what you're thinking. Watch. Well, he's Jesus and I'm not. Well, I recognize that this morning. Believe me, I know you're not Jesus, okay? I, I got that impression when I stood up here that you're not Jesus. However, we can learn from Jesus. As a matter of fact, the word favor and the word grace in our Bible are twin words. So when Jesus was full of favor, he was full of grace, joy, and kindness. That means when Jesus worked at the carpenter shop with his father, uh, he was full of joy, grace, and kindness. When he interacted with people of the community, somebody tell me, he was full of grace, joy, and kindness. Are you getting this? So, here's me to you. If I'm going to experience the favor of God, it might mean that we need to stop here just a moment and ask ourselves, are we full of grace? Is anybody listening to me this morning? If we don't go any further this morning, and I got tons of notes, so you hope that I don't go much further than this. Grace Joy and kindness. It blows my mind how Christians today act in accordance with the world instead of with the Bible. It blows my mind how people speak today in, in worldly language instead of Bible language. It blows my mind how we believe that we can conduct our lives in any manner and think that we ought to have the favor of God on our lives. Now, if we're going to have the favor of God on our lives, and if favor is kin to the word grace, that means that you and I ought to display grace, joy, and kindness. Grace, joy, and kindness. One more time. So this is where we're going to be jumping off in the next couple of weeks. Now, let me be honest with you. Let me be very honest with you. Some of those traits do not come natural for us because we're fallen humans at best. And so because they don't come natural for us, we're going to have to work at these. Joy and kindness. Wait a minute, one more time. Joy. Joy. Some of you hadn't known what that meant in a long, long, long time. Sour puss. You wake up as a sour puss. You walk through the dead. dead 
your day is a sour puss and you go to bed, sour puss. Nobody even knows that you're saved. Nobody knows that you're a Christian. If, if somebody found out you're a Christian, somebody would go, really? Really? You know how they speak? Potty mouth. You know how they live? You dirty, filthy, rotten animal. Grace, joy, kindness. So, I want the favor of God. So if I'm going to get the favor of God, I need to jump off somewhere. So how about let's jump off with grace, joy, and kindness. Right? Okay. I love the stories because it helps me enjoy my relationship with the Lord more. In order for us to learn what the favor of God is, we're going to be over in the book of Exodus for the next several weeks. And so turn, if you will, to the book of Exodus because this is going to be crucial in our discussion. Now, I told you all ago to have the favor of God does not come easy for us. It, it has to be a learned trait. It has to be something that we're going to pursue more than something that we just automatically know. So if I need the, the favor of God, I need to find out what it is, how I can achieve it, and what it means in the long term. I hope that somebody really is listening to the preacher this morning because I think this is so crucial for us as a church in, our, in, in, in where we are right now. So here is a gentleman that we're going to learn about that probably had a very difficult time more than most. This Old Testament character, despite his failure and hardships, he sought out the favor of God. But he didn't know he was searching it out at the beginning. That's the great part. He did not know he was on the journey to the favor of God until the end of his life. Somebody look at me and shake. All right, we're going. Look at Exodus chapter 2 and verse 14. Exodus chapter 2 and verse 14. Now this is what this is what propelled him on this long journey of the favor of God. And he says, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? And tendest thou to kill me? Watch. As thou killed the Egyptian? And Moses feared, comma, and said, comma, watch. Surely this thing is known. Now, if anybody started out his earthly pilgrimage about finding the favor of God, it would not have been Moses. Grace? Kindness? No. No. This verse is right after the fact that he just killed a man. His sin was found out. And by the way, can I tell you something? I'm looking in your eyes. Your sin will find you out. Hide it in the sand if you want to, but somebody's going to scratch it out and you're going to be found out. So here we see Moses killed this guy and so now everything is revealed in Moses' life. You know the story, so we're going to pick it up there and get as far as we can this morning if we can. Now, I want you to notice, if you will, Exodus chapter 2, verse number 14, it says this. I want you to see this. Intendest thou to kill me as I killed an Egyptian. So we see that early on right here, that, jo uh, that, excuse me, that Moses began with a very, very unfortunate incident in his life. Now, because he killed a man, he went on the run. So go to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. And this is where we'll camp this morning. Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared. If you, if you have a pen, would you circle that? The angel of the Lord, that's important. He appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. And here's an interesting scene. But the bush was what? Not consumed. 
And Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, not a sight, but a great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, saw that he turned aside to see, now that's crucial, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Now, I know you know this, but for the sake of me telling you this, I want you to catch this. The Bible says, watch this. When the Lord saw that Moses turned, then what happened? God called him out of the midst of the bush. Moses made a step toward God, and then God spoke to him. I'll get back to that. And he says, hear mine, he says, draw not, not thy thither, put off thy shoes from thy foot, for the place where in thy stand is his holy ground. Now, one glimpse, one encounter, out of the way meeting changed everything. How many times in that wilderness that Moses spent 40 years in, did he think of that time that he killed that Egyptian? Do you think it was more than once? Do you think that Moses, Moses in the process of time was overwrought with guilt by doing what he did? The Bible says when he killed that Egyptian, and by the way, he had a kind of a comfortable life. Moses was a favored son. By the way, Moses was going to be the next big boy on the block. He would have been the next Pharaoh on the block. Moses was in line for a tremendous promotion if he had just stayed right there where he was, did everything, obeyed the Egyptian gods, did all the Egyptian things. But for some reason or another, he went down at that time, killed the Egyptian, flew to the backside of the desert or to the wilderness, and he stayed there. Look at this. He stayed there for 40 years. And I'm going to tell you this. I can tell you in that 40 years, he probably never thought about the favor of God. I would venture to say that for those 40 years, he constantly thought about his sheep. He constantly thought about the hot desert. And he constantly thought, well, how in the world did I go so wrong? Everything was in my grasp, but now I let it go because I got angry. I could preach a message on anger, but I won't. Here we have a delicate situation in the life of Moses. But this is the part that I love. Nothing grows in the desert. When you go to the desert, your dreams die. When you go to the desert, nothing blooms. When you go to the desert, it's over. There's nothing good that happens in the desert. Watch this. Until God shows up. You see, when we talk about the desert, we talk about hard times. When we talk about the desert, we talk about bad, bad, difficult moments and desert days and hot days and nothing good happens there. But God shows up in, in all places in a bush. Are you listening? Could, could God have showed up in anywhere he wanted to show up at? The Bible says he was the bush that burned. Oh, preacher, I'm just telling you, that's what your Bible says. He was the bush that burned. And Moses, watch this, was so intrigued that he made a step towards God. And when Moses made that step towards God, that's where his life began to change. You know how to get the favor of God? Is start making your step towards God. It didn't have to be a large step. It don't even have to be a step that you understand everything that's going on. It just simply means I want to find out more about who God is. Now, when Moses made that step toward God and this bush was burning but not consumed, he had to sit there and think a minute. I, watch this. What in the world could this be? Have you ever asked yourself when you was in one of those situations, with your relationship with God, how in the world could God work this situation out? How in the world can this burning bush, how in the world could God fix something that just doesn't look like it can be fixed? You see, when you are on your quest to find the favor of God, you're going to find some interesting thoughts and interesting things on the way. Now, my question to you is this. 
maybe there could be somebody here in the wilderness. All roads look blocked. You wonder if God knows your name. Has it been a while since you have since God's leading? And now the years have turned into decades. Your one wrong decision years earlier has caused you a lifetime of regret. However, God shows up in that bush to this forgotten man. Moses' is dreary life, but now takes on a new perspective. I want you to see something that this is so spellbounding that I want you to mark it in your Bible if you have a pen. Tell me if you are still at Exodus chapter 3. Amen? I want you to scan down, if you will, and I want you to look at a verse that I have reread and read and read and read, and I want you to show you verse number 11. Exodus chapter 3 in verse number 11. Now, God's calling Moses, and uh, he sees all of the things that's going on. Now, watch it. No, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Wait a minute before I want to do that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want you uh, to go to verse 4, not verse 11, verse 4. I want you to notice verse number 4. Watch this. This is so crucial, and this is where we're going to camp here in just a moment. Look what he says. In this bush, in the midst of the bush, called, called him out, and notice how many times he called his name. Look, 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 look. How many times? So God called his name twice. How many times do you think in the last 40 years that Moses heard his name called? Probably not very many times. And God wanted to get his attention. He didn't just say, Moses! I like it. Moses. Moses. In other words, I've come to get your attention. Now, notice his next response. And he said, who's he, Moses? Notice his next response. Here am I. You want to have the favor of God on your life? There it is. Start right there. Here am I. You see, there could be somebody that's rejecting God's call on your life. Maybe God is just calling you to clean up an area of your life that you've let go unintended for a long time. Maybe there's a door in your life that, that you haven't allowed the God to open and clean it out. Maybe there it is where you need to be to find the favor of God is here am I. In other words, God, I am yours. Can I tell you? Watch this. When Moses says here am I, here am I you, know what he, you know what that means in our vocabulary? It means yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what it means. It means yes, sir. What do you want me to do is what that means. Moses. At the very outset of his very public ministry here, in just a few chapters we're going to learn, started in the right way. He saw the bush, he made that step, then he told God, here am I. He didn't even know, watch this, he didn't even know he was on the journey of the favor of God until he was far in his journey. But we are seeing it from the peripheral. We're seeing it from the beginning of, of his ministry. Here am I. You know what? There could be somebody in this room that needs to tell God. God, I'm dealing with something right now in my heart. And I've been trying to do it. Come on with me. I've been trying to manufacture the outcome. I've tried to spin myself out of it. I've tried to do something for it. And I just can't do it. Maybe it's time for somebody in this room. God, watch this. Here am out of the bush, Lord, you're speaking. Now, I may not fully, totally understand it yet. I may not comprehend what that means right now. But the first thing that I can do is, Lord, I consecrate my life unto you. Because here's what I've learned as a pastor. The best life that you will learn is under the obedience of God Almighty. The most miserable life that you'll learn and earn is what you do on your own accord. And you try to push God out. Is anybody listening this morning? He says, here am I. Timothy Stackpole was a New York firefighter who was severely burned in a 1998 fire. After he recovered, he returned to the force despite the advice of friends and family and the fact that he could retire very comfortably. He, the reports say that he was a great 
firefighter and passionate about his work. And eventually, he was promoted to captain. Timothy was one of those firefighters that ran into the second tower to try to save many people on 911. When he did, it collapsed and took his life. Reports said this about Timothy Stackpole. It said this. He knew his calling. Watch this. He went in to save people. The Holy Spirit has called us to a lifetime of service. And the Lord Jesus has come to seek and to save them that are lost. And can I tell you what I'm learning? That God calls us in our desert days to make that step to that burning bush. And maybe our response to God today needs to be here. Am I? Lord, I, I, Lord God, I have just, I've just made a mess of things. But Lord, I'm just giving you my heart, my hands, and my life. What's this? Here am I. You know, when, when Moses did that, that changed his life. It's changed his future. And I just wonder if somebody in here needs a new change of life and a new change of future. In these next weeks, we're going to see how the progression goes from the very outset to the very culmination of Moses and how the favor of God was on him and how you and I can share that same thing. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to pre preach this morning. Lord, and I, I, I mean this with all sincerity. I'm very humbled by those that came this morning. And Lord, I, I know that people have other places and other obligations and think that there are so many things that Demand their time and attention. But Father, from the youth to the adults, I'm so grateful that they chose to be in this place at this time. Father, if there ever a time in the world that we need to, to find the favor of God, it is now. It is with our heads uplifted and to give God the glory that He rightfully deserves. I wonder if we're trying to impede upon the glory of God I wonder in the way that we live if we tried to seek out our own glory instead of knowing his glory when Moses turned to see that bush that day all things opened up for this man and I can tell you, he was in 40 years of a downward life and a downward spiral. He must have thought over and over, I'm going to die just like this. I'm going to die in the desert of no account. I'm going to die in the desert of one bad mistake I made. I'm going to die and nobody's even going to notice. But God showed up. Maybe God showed up in this room this morning for you. And maybe that step towards God will be the door that unlocks unlimited possibilities for you. Father, I pray for each foot, each heart, each home that's represented. Lord, on this quest to find the favor of God, I have learned so many information that it's just, it's just been a thrilling study on my heart. I pray, Father, that I too will take these words and apply them. Grace, joy, and kindness. Father, for those that are gathered today, I pray whatever condition our hearts are in, that they'll lock arms with Jesus and find what they need in Him and Him alone. Would you stand with me all over the building as Brother Randy sings, would you respond?